Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for <clears throat> the panel. It's all about us, the many voices of speculative fiction. And uh, I will start with a very brief introduction of the panel, the idea behind the panel, and our four panelists. Um, this panel was meant to celebrate the myriad voices exploring speculative fiction and poetry um, inspired by experiences of uh, different people around the world um, and from various backgrounds. Um, so we will be uh, in conversation with representatives from uh, Neon Hemlock, Aqueduct Press, Faya Literary Magazine, and poet Marlena Chertok uh, will be here to represent poetry writ large. And we'll be talking about queer, feminist, disabled, and BIPOC speculative visions of the world, uh, also known as BIPOC. I'm never quite sure how to announce that uh, acronym. Um, so very briefly, I'm going to uh, introduce our panelists. We will then uh, start a, a discussion to give you an idea of where they're from, what kinds of work they're doing, what kinds of work is out there to be experienced. Um, and then we will have an opportunity for audience Q&A. So you are welcome to uh, insert questions um, in the chat uh, as we go. And I will sort of round those up toward the end of the session and try and get to as many as I can. Um, so, with no further ado, I will start uh, with uh, introducing uh, Elle Timmel Duchamp, or Timmy, as we'll be referring to her. She's the author of the five volume Mark Sand Cycle, which won a special Tiptree Award honor in 2009. And she is the founder and publisher of Aqueduct Press, which is a feminist sci fi press. Um, Amalia Harrington is a disabled. Q women, woman of color with a, a deep love of speculative fiction. She's an acquiring editor at FIA as well as a fiction and nonfiction writer. And her work can be found at FIA, Glittership, Anathema, and other venues. Uh, Dave Ring is a queer editor and writer of speculative fiction living in Washington, DC. He is the publisher and managing editor of Neon Hemlock Press as well as the co-editor of Baffling Magazine. And his short fiction has been featured in numerous publications, including Fireside Fiction, Podcastle, and A Punk Rock Future. And Marlena Chertok has two books of poetry, Crumb Size Poems, and on that one-way trip to Mars, she is queer and disabled, using her skeletal dysplasia as a bridge to scientific poetry, and that's what she'll be uh, talking about tonight. And Marlena serves as co-chair of Outright and is on the board of Split This Rock. So I have mentioned a lot of presses and organizations out there that you, know, you may or may not be familiar with. So at this time, I would like to invite each of our participants to um, talk more about their press and the types of things they publish, as well as cats walking across screens. And I'll just ask that folks limit, try and limit themselves to five minutes um, and we can definitely dive into more detail in our conversation. Um, but Timmy, would you mind starting and telling us a little bit about Aqueduct Press, please? And uh, you, are, you are muted actually still. So if you could unmute yourself. Okay, perfect. I founded Aqueduct in 2004 at a time when dissent was considered unpatriotic and threatening by mainstream culture. Um, the first novel we published that year, Life, by Gwyneth Jones, was considered unpublishable by commercial publishers. It won the Philip K. Dick Award, which is one of the, of the field's most prestigious awards. And many of the books we've published since then have followed that pattern, winning a variety of awards, particularly awards focusing on gender, race, and sexual identity. Many of our authors are queer, many are people of color. And um, one of the first things I did when I started Aqueduct was to reach out to Black women writers. So they've been on board from the beginning. 
And in fact, one of the first books I commissioned was Nisi Shaw and Cynthia Ward's Writing the Other, which is one of our best selling titles and has changed the way a lot of workshops um, teach writing. Aqueduct publishes not only feminist science fiction and fantasy, but also books that engage with it. For instance, Strange Mating, Science Fiction, Feminism, Afri African American Voices, and Octavia Butler, edited by Nisi Shaw and Rebecca Holden. We also publish poetry. Let's see, how much time do I have left here? Uh, okay, well, so I have time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I wanted to especially mention we have that we have three ongoing series of which we're particularly proud. The WizCon Chronicle series, which engages with real world controversies and conflicts in the, in the sphere of speculative feminism. And it centers on WizCon, which is the world's greatest science fiction convention as it's been billed for decades. <laughs> the, on, Another series is the Conversation Pieces series, which, in, um, which is now up to 82 volumes, where innovative and controversial work engaging in what I call the grand conversation of feminist science fiction can find a home. Um, and another of our series is the Heirloom Book series, which aims to bring back into print and preserve work that has helped make feminist science fiction what it is today. The series takes its name from the seeds of older strains of vegetables so valuable and in danger of being lost. And that is really true of all feminist history. <laughs> it's always getting lost. And so we're, we're trying to do our bit to, to preserve it. So for some idea of the scope of the writing we publish, which is just all over the map of anything that can be considered feminist, um, I urge you to check out our catalog at www.aqueductpress.com just to give you an idea. Oh, and I wanted to say, um, I didn't say very much about our LGBTQ authors, but many of our authors fit that designation. And three of our most recent books <clears throat> are by trans authors. Um, and so uh, just please check it out because I think you'll be surprised and um, thrilled to see the, the range of, of work available. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Timmy. And full disclosure, I have a couple of titles out in the conversation series with <laughs> so just full disclosure here, everything above board. Um, thank you so much for introducing us to Faya. I would like to introduce uh, Amalia uh, next to tell us, uh, or sorry, thanks for introducing us to Aqueduct. Next up is Faya, and I would like to uh, invite Amalia to uh, tell us something about that, uh, that press. Well, one of the catalysts for FIA was the 2016 report by Fireside Fiction. It's like the state of black speculative fiction. Almost none of the pro-rate magazines publish black authors. That's the short of it. So I was like, so a, a group of authors from the Nigarati space station and an online space where black authors can do their do their thing without having to worry about interference from uh, from non black people is like, well, this sucks. We got to do something about it. Hey, how about and the idea eventually came became FIA the magazine. And, which is named after a short-lived magazine named Fire, with an R, that was born during the Harlem Renaissance. 
The full story of the origins of FIA can be found on our website. And one of the things I rather appreciate is that we have a broad idea of blackness, which other online writing spaces really do not. I have assorted horror stories. So it's like mixed black, black from here, black from there. If it's in your identity, have at it, apply. We are, since I'm pretty sure I have some of my five minutes left, mm -hmm. in addition to winning awards and paying a semi-pro rate, we are slowly working our way up to doing pro rates for our authors to help get the coveted SUFWA qualifications and further help Black authors move move up into the SFF world. We also hold our own convention, FIACON, the second of which is coming in, in mid-September. We've, we've collaborated with Tor.com for the Voices on FIA anthology. We now offer grants. Again, please turn to the website for more information. And among other projects includes a collaboration with LeVar Burton. And we also hold a monthly game show for writers called M Dash. We have a lot going on. So if you identify, please give us a look. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, both FIA and Aqueduct, uh, I, as I understand, um, publish both poetry and prose. Um, so, so poets, you are very much welcome here and we'll talk some more about that as well. Um, but now I would like to uh, give the mic to Neon Hemlock and Dave Ring is going to tell us about that project in press. Thanks. Um... So I think we're the new kid on the block and just founded in 2019. Um, so I actually founded the press because I needed somewhere to publish the um, outright DC's uh, chapbook competition winners. And as well, I needed to find a home for an anthology that I was shopping around um, called Glitter and Ashes, Queer Tales of a World That Wouldn't Die. And um, so I had to start one myself. and. Uh, it's sort of, it's, it's something that's snowballed in a way that has been, um, I, I guess like both affirming for me, like personally, as well as like connecting with a broader community that's been pretty valuable, um, like largely related to, um, queer writers and readers, but, um, I think, I think also just, uh, trying to do our bit to, uh, lift up all boats, so to speak. So, um, and, and this year, so, so last year was our first full year, first full year of publications. And I think we had 12 and then we have 13 this year. Um, and I just got the proof for the first in our um, new series called, uh, We're Here, the Best Queer Speculative Fiction, um, which is, you know, Unbound and everything still. Uh, so trying to, cook up some new things and, and uh, forge some new paths. Um, in addition to anthologies, uh, this new best of series, um, we do publish um, assorted zines and chat books like the Swing Queer Space Force that Marlene is in actually. Um, we had uh, our first poetry series this year edited by Saida Agostini. And um, uh, so we have two entries in that series this year. Um, we're continuing with uh, a novella series. We put up four last year and another four this year. Um, and, then, and right now I'm in the middle of uh, edits and layouts for our new anthology, Unfettered Hexes, Queer Tales of Insatiable Darkness. Um, and, uh, and just, I, I don't know, things keep snowballing. Like I also just made like bandanas and altar cloths too. And I, I have a, a problem with not following whatever... Uh, idea I get in my head. Um, and it's so it's been a wild ride, but it's been a, a rewarding one. 
Thank you. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, for those who may not be familiar with Outright, could you tell us a little bit about that? You still have a, a couple of minutes left. Oh, yeah. um, sure. And I, maybe I can start it off and then Marlena can give you the, the, um, the current update. So um, Outright is DC's uh, LGBTQ literary festival. Um, and I was involved as the chair for five years, and now um, Marlena and Malik Thompson are the are the chairs. Um, so it's both an annual festival in Washington D.C. as well as uh, a number of events uh, during the year, depending on what the chairs cook up. Um, so uh, this year and last year, the events have both been virtual, um, and. Partly, I think, because of the interests of both myself and Marlena, there's always sort of been like a pretty significant um, speculative uh, force representing both prose and poetry. So um, that's been a cool way to connect both the speculative world as well as queer writers. Right. Okay. Thank you for providing that background. Absolutely. And yes, now I'd like to turn to Marlena to talk a little bit more about speculative poetry writ large. Yeah, not not a, a huge task at all. <laughs> but <laughs> tell us everything thank, there is to know about it right now. Five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Tara, and thank you uh, to everybody on the panel as well. It's just I'm really in awe to be in a space with you all because you've been creating and building space uh, for for folks, and that's that's huge. Um, so thank you for the the work you do. Um, I. I'm a poet. I also do dabble in prose as well. Um, a lot of my short stories are speculative fiction as well. So I feel like it's a mix um, for, for myself. And there, uh, I don't know, I just have found that science and science inspired writing is a huge interest of mine. I also work in the environmental and climate change space. So I feel like I never quite leave it, <laughs> but it's what terrifies me and I write what terrifies me. And um, yeah, there, there's so many different ways to write about science, to write about um, things that you just cook up in your brain. Uh, I think science fiction and speculative writing are so hugely important because they show imagined worlds that that we can make. Um, they show what what we want, where we want to see ourselves. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, disability speculative fiction, and I just want to mention a few projects. Um, let's see. This year, uh, Sundress Publications had a call called Nom Bono, an anthology of speculative poetry by BIPOC creators. And it uh, Nom Bono is the Zulu word for visionary. So I think that speculative fiction, speculative poetry really like pushes that forward. Um, and it really, it can be anything there. I, maybe in the past there probably was gatekeeping. Right now I feel like it's become pretty vast and open. And as you can see from the, the presses on the panel, um, the space is being created and people are really being welcomed in and uplifted. Um, the Deaf Poets Society, uh, that is D-E-A-F, Deaf Poets Society, uh, is an online literary journal that publishes um, poetry, prose, cross-genre work of deaf or disabled uh, writers. And they, a few years back, I think it was in 2017, they had a themed issue um, called Crips in Space. Um, so definitely check that out if you haven't yet. And then let's see. Yeah, there, there's, there's just so many anthologies. I won't be able to mention them all, but we can definitely like provide resources. But just to mention a few that are specific um, and important to, to my journey, because I'm a disabled and queer writer, um, Beauty is a Verb, uh, The New Poetry of Disability, uh, the white, sorry, the right way to be crippled and naked, uh, the fiction of disability, and disabled people destroy science fiction, um, tripping the tale, fantastic weird fiction by deaf and hard of hearing writers. Uh, there's just there, there's a lot, so so definitely check them out, search them out. There there's so much out there, and 
just to mention uh, something that I found that I didn't even know about uh, is called sci-fi coup. So science fiction haiku. So, you know, it it's any anything you can imagine and more. Uh, it could be form, it doesn't have to be form. Yeah, that's why I really enjoy exploring this space. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing up those, uh, those mark. I love sci-fi coup. I learn something every time I do one of these panels. Um, but let's go ahead. And now that we have some basic introductions, um, I'd like to sort of talk about the inspiration behind focusing on speculative fiction, science, uh, science fiction, fantasy, um, you know, surrealism. Um, anything that is, you know, sort of painting the world in a world that is slightly different from our own current reality. Um, and if you could, for a moment, talk about why you were drawn, both as an author and then, you know, enough to want to become involved in the presses. Why were you drawn to speculative work? Like, if you're writing about the human condition, why not just write in reality, right? Why not, why not write about being disabled or queer or, you know, uh, being black or any of these, you know, areas we're talking about or being a woman? Um, what is that value added, that extra spark that you get out of sort of exploring the subject matter in a speculative realm? And you can go in any order. Yes, Timmy. <clears throat> okay, for me, as a writer, um, there were two or three things that really, uh, apart from having discovered what could be done in science fiction by authors like Delaney, Russ, Charnas, um, Le Guin, right? First of all, it, it, it allows us to expand our moral imagination. And I think our moral imagination is where, at least here in the US, we are severely lacking. Um, secondly, it allows us to imagine a different way of being. Again, in the US, we, we've sort of for decades were stuck in, this is the way it is and it's the only way it can be. And you just have to accept it. Well, I don't agree with that. And I think that's something that we have to break through. And I think actually we are starting to break through it, <laughs> strange as it seems. Um, and third, for me, I want to find different ways of thinking about how people relate to one another and relate to the world. And the best way to do that is through speculation um, and creating other different sorts of ways of being and then explore it. And, and then of course you can draw insights and resonances from that. It, it's very hard to invent concepts. <laughs> they don't just show up. Um, and I think what got me into that was the um, burst of feminist theory in the 70s and 80s, where people were talking about what they were experiencing in completely new ways. And I saw that science fiction was the way to really do that. And maybe the fourth thing is that a lot of straight non-speculative fiction for me when it talked about anything political was polemical and i didn't want to write polemics i wanted to write stories and so for me that was the reason as far as publishing the stuff that comes into me just blows my mind <laughs> and and so i've got to publish it and I don't, and that hardly ever happens with um, literary fiction. I mean, there are some great literary fiction, but it just operates differently on my imagination. And I think imagination is the key. Okay, 
Thank you. I appreciate that. So what are some other thoughts about speculative fiction, why it lends itself to what you want to express? Um, Amalia. Um, part of the reason I gravitate towards fiction, like as I enjoy writing my nonfiction as well as, the, as my descriptor said, but one of the beauties of fiction is possibilities. And while there is a spot for realism, I also want to think uh, about things that aren't necessarily in my day-to-day -day life. And, uh, and part of my desire to write speculative fiction is, well, partly stemming from my love of comic books and other genre things. But there's also in my work a strong sense of piss off now, science fiction and fantasy is not a, is a space for everyone, not just white heterosexual men. All right, all right, succinctly stated. And that is the organizing principle of this panel, actually. Um, you know, encouraging thinking about speculative fiction as the realm of everybody, because science is coming at everybody. Climate change is coming at everybody. Um, you know, uh, all of the um, advancements uh, is coming. Eventually, you know, billionaires will go into space, but eventually that technology trickles down to all of us, right? So we are all facing what's coming at us. And so we all have a right to imagine and be heard in the world of the future and our thoughts about, you know, what is happening now and how that's going to affect our future. So that's absolutely uh, what this panel is about. Um, but would anyone else, uh, does anyone else have anything to add in terms of how you got into writing this genre and, and you know, what drives you to be involved in publishing it for those who do? Maybe just a small rebuttal <laughs> that yeah. um, uh, I just, I, I feel like in general, um, a large amount of, genre is sort of like unnecessarily siloed right and you know lots of work has speculative elements lots of it um i mean even i'm stealing this from someone much smarter than me i can't think of who it is right now but you know even like svu is built on the fantasy that that police will actually solve like <laughs> investigate and solve these crimes so and that's a, largely as a speculative concept so you know so much in, in rom-coms are built around a, a speculative idea of like what a relationship looks like so you know so many of genres are built on these conceits and or uh, I don't know elements that we just like we go in with and we accept and we roll with them so um, I think there's also something there maybe someone else is smarter and can, can, can connect the dots here but I feel like there's something there as far as um like what we connect with as um, as people, as storytellers, as listeners, as as readers, um, and what those different elements allow us to do. Like just because they aren't commonplace or things that happen every day doesn't mean they're not powerful stories for different reasons, or that they don't scratch a certain itch. Um, and the reason I got into publishing was because so much of what seemed to be out there, and this is you know changing in, in lots of ways, but. Um, just what the, the work I wanted to read wasn't there. And I was hoping to contribute in some small way to putting out more of the, the stories that I wanted to be to be reading. Um, and you know, I'll still write, I keep writing my stories and trying to get those out there too. And, and that's a, it's sort of a, di a different uh, hustle, but um, that's part of why I got in on the publishing side. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna bounce off of what Dave and others were saying. Um, I think that for me, growing up, I struggled to find representations of myself in literature and fiction and poetry. And I think it is changing now. Of course, we could do better and there could be more. But I, I really remember, so I, 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 have a, I have a bone disorder and a lot of chronic pain. And uh, as a teen, I developed scoliosis. And really the only book that I remember that really like struck me as being, hey, that's kind of like my story was Dini by Judy Bloom. Um, and that's just one. And, and now there's so much uh, 
so much out there in terms of anthologies of disabled writing. There's uh, people have, for, for years and years have been calling this criplet, uh, so like crippled literature. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a form of taking it back. It's a form of owning it. It's a form of saying the word because disability and, and crip is not a, a derogatory word. It's really an identity um, and a way to, you know, uh, push for change and push for more accessibility. So I think that a lot of what speculative work does is allows us to see ourselves, allows us to see a more inclusive space, um, as well as like those dystopian versions too. So it's a little bit of warning um, of what we currently have, of how, you know, a, 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 a more dystopian world too, and also a bit of here's how it could look, but also, you know, spec speculative really runs the gamut where sometimes you really want to see yourself and sometimes it's aliens and people in space and wacky whatever Tara like is incredible at writing just anything um, that comes to her mind and I want to like be in her brain because it seems like a really fun place but like there there can be anything like in in something Dave just recently published Queer Space Force there was a story about um, what was it body lice on a decaying corpse like who comes up with this crazy, amazing writing? It, it's it's incredible. I'm Craig Gidney for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only speculative writers, and it's exactly what I think Timmy and and uh, Amalia were saying. It's really powerful. All right. So we have touched on a lot of topics here. It's hard to know which direction to go, but. Um, uh, one of the things that came up was this idea of siloing, um, this idea of what are the expectations, you know, what, uh, like if you are a specific writer, what, how are you supposed to be writing, right? If you're a literary writer, how are you supposed to be writing? And those things are supposed to be so different. But um, I was wondering if you could talk about, um, you know, we've also been saying that things are changing in terms of how much representation there is out there. So if you could, um, what are some other uh, publications or, or authors that people could be looking at who are, you know, either um, sort of bridging this gap between the speculative and the literary in ways that are new and exciting? Um, are there presses out there that seem to be more accepting of speculative work, even if they aren't speculative in nature? Um, just in this space of representation and, you know, being able to roll with speculative elements, um, what are some other uh, markets and some, some people that we should be looking at, um, uh, folks who are in this area, even if they don't, you know, sort of narrowly fit in one category? I can throw some quick names yeah, um, while other people are racking their brain. Um, so there's a few magazines recently that I'm really excited to see where they go that have been that have launched in the last couple of years. So for short form uh, speculative work. So one of them is Corio, which is a new mag that's targeting um, folks who are part of a diaspora. So like looking at um, like immigrant immigration stories and like that kind of um, uh, of, of all of all sorts. Um, there's also I, I have I have no Spanish, so it's like it's constel it's constellation it's like constellation, but it's in Spanish. Uh, so uh, they're doing really cool work. They have a couple issues out now, I think, um, and uh, they're looking at um, both. Um, I'd have to pull it up to double check, but it's like it's looking at um, part of what's what's great about these magazines. It's similar to the way Amalia was talking about the way. Faya has an open sort of like view of blackness that is is bringing more people in. Is there really there? They have specific but broad approaches to how they reach their people. So like, Corey is about diaspora. I want to say Constellation is is fifty percent hoping to be uh, from Spanish speakers broadly. Um, I think I don't have it right in front of me, but um, and then uh, Augur is another one that's. Um, wants to have at least 50% um, Canadian and Indigenous Canadian publications. They also do a really cool job of looking at 
um i know it's kind of a charged term but like magical realism for, for in the broader um idea of what that kind of writing would be um so the work that kind of is liminal between literary and speculative spaces so those are three magazines that i sort of have my eye on and i'm always um excited both for their inclusive editorial eye as well as um the sort of ideas that they're putting into the universe Great, thank you. Yeah, I was just looking at Constellation today, um, and uh, the cool thing about that is they will facilitate translations, um, so you can submit in either Spanish or English, and they will facilitate for accepted works. They will translate into the other language. So, um, so that's that's an awesome feature of that uh, lit mag. Who else has anything to add? Who are your competitors? Is another way of asking this question. <laughs> Yes, Lalia. I wouldn't call them competitors, maybe cousins. Uh, other magazines I can think of off the top of my head is, I apologize because I don't know the proper pronunciation, Ome Nana, who specializes in, specializes in not just black public authors, but people from Africa. And since I am Black Indian, I also got to do a shout out to Anathema Magazine, who publishes stuff by authors of color with an eye towards queer indigenous authors. Uh, as for the, as for stuff that goes like literary versus genre versus I don't know what. I don't know where the line is for all I know. Okay. I personally think this line is arbitrary, but maybe somebody else has has more uh, articulate thoughts than me. I will just bring up the book, Never Let Me Go, written by Kazuo Ishiguro, no big prize winning author. Somehow this is not under science fiction, but under the literary section in the library and bookstore. Yeah, absolutely. The first time I read it, I did not realize I was reading science fiction. It was not built that way, but is absolutely built upon a science fiction premise. So um, that is an excellent point embedded in there. Thank you. And uh, Marlena, anything to add? I mean, not from the public. Well, perhaps if you've worked on publications, you can speak to that as well um, that you know would be relevant. Yeah, sure. I have a few thoughts. Um, mentioned earlier um, the Deaf Poets Society Journal. Um, and not only do they, uh, they don't necessarily focus on speculative, but I would uh, maybe argue that Criplet in its own vein is a way of being speculative. Um, Rogue Agent is another uh, journal that focuses on publishing um, uh, disabled writers. There's also Monstering Mag and Sick Magazine and Word Gathering. And then some that are a little more speculative in nature. Um, Paranoid Tree Zine uh, is doing some really cool work. Uh, they publish one story in a zine, I think every month. Um, and, and I was also published in it. So complete full disclosure. Um, and then some others that have been doing really fun, uh, a little more accessible work, I think, uh, just in terms of making things, uh, more free and, and, uh, I think social media has a way of bringing people in who maybe even didn't consider themselves poets or writers. And to me, that is really important because I didn't, um, take like a typical route, I think. I, I didn't get an MFA and things like that. That's a whole other spiel. Um, but things like Lesbians or Miracles, a free online magazine that they release as a PDF. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love that there's many ways in to this kind of work. All right. Well, I, I just realized that I don't think we have a way to get questions in this session. So um, I will just uh, keep on asking questions. 
Before we do, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of um, presses. Um, and this full disclosure is from my submission history. Um, so that's how I know of them. There is a relatively new series of um, uh, paper or sort of uh, um, uh, hard copy anthologies called If There's Anyone Left. And they focus on speculative flash fiction from um, authors of color. Um, and there is also um, Flame Tree Publishing does various anthologies um, where they mix current authors with um, you know, classics. And they just put out black sci-fi short stories. Um, so there's, uh, you know, I, I have a story that appears in the same book as W.B. W. E. B. Du Bois, The Comet, for example. Um, and their current call is also looking, I can't find it at the moment, but they are also looking for another sort of, you know, marginalized community. They're doing a special- I think it's out. Asian ghost stories. That's it, yes. Thank you for pulling that out of your brain because I was not going to be able to. But, um, so that's another, um, uh, press to look for. They don't do explicitly, they, they do different genres uh, all the time, but they've done, the, their last couple have focused on um, sort of marginalized uh, communities and speculative as well. Um, and that's something I'd like to just, you know, from my perspective uh, mention and that we've all been alluding to um, that uh, publishers, seem to be opening up in terms of what types of realities they are willing to consider. Um, and markets that don't necessarily consider themselves speculative markets are open now more than ever. I feel particularly in the flash world because that's what I do a lot of, but um, that they're open to something of the supernatural, a hint of it, or just some kind of unreal element entering the work and informing the work. So, you know, uh, Dave had mentioned the siloing and I think, um, you know, we're in a good, we're, we're in a, a, a fertile ground now where we can choose to go hard into the tropes and seek out those, you know, legacy operations, or we can sort of blend, you know, our literary and our speculative and our fantabulous uh, elements together and, and face a more, um, you know, not, not quite the hostile audience we used to face perhaps as submitters, as writers. Um, Timmy, did I skip over you? Yes, thanks, sorry about that. I, I just wanted to mention a couple of presses that I consider cousins, I like that term. Yeah, thank because you for providing that. Actually, we don't operate as rivals because we complement one another and we also help one another, especially at the beginning. So, um, <laughs> Um, there's Tachyon Publishing, uh, Tachyon Publications. Um, they recently, by the way, published R.B. Lindbergh's The Four Weaves, which is a really outstanding um, queer novella. Um, and Small Beer Press, that's um, Kelly Link and Gavin Grant's press. They've, they've been around longer than we have, both of them have. And, <clears throat> and now I can't remember the name of the press. It's driving me nuts. It's Bill Campbell's press, which I think really belongs in this. Rosarium. Yes, Rosarium. Um, so anyway, I think all of these, I, I really like Marlena's um, description of building space, because I think that's really what we've been all about, is making more space. And of course, when it's out there, it helps new writers write towards a different kind of market than they traditionally had to, to write towards. And of course, now what happens often is that the big presses then pick up the authors. We, we start out with. Um, Tor acquired Andrea Hairston and her entire backlist recently, which we originally published, right? <laughs> and I was thrilled. 
you know, that she finally is going to get a huge audience. Um, and um, Kini Ibora Salams, uh, not Kini, sorry. <laughs> um, Jennifer Brissett, Elysium is, is her, she's going to have a sequel published by Tor. And we published her Elysium. And so while a lot of writers get dumped and then come to us, <laughs> the, the reverse happens. So it's like there's this back and forth flow between publishers like Aqueduct Press and the biggest presses. It's very interesting. <laughs> We're actually paving the way, making space for work that was considered unpublishable. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. changes about. I, I'm very pleased about that. Yeah. Well, speaking of the hustle, um, you know, with all of you, uh, you know, working with publications and with organizations, um, as well as doing your own work, um, what are some tips you have for folks in terms of how you handle the hustle and how you make space for your own work? How do you balance those things out? Um, and I just got a 10 minute warning. So we have a little time. Um, don't worry, you don't have to say the two words, but um, so yeah, what, what are some tips you would advise for folks who are, like a lot of us are authors and editors, right? So how do you manage those two worlds? Yes, Timmy. I've been, I've, I struggled for years over this. And what I eventually did was I did two things. One, I, I physically demarcated where Aqueduct Press is in my house and made a special space for my own work. And I never bring work into that room. So that helps because you, your head space changes when you move from room to room. Secondly, I block out periods of time when I will not do anything for Aqueduct Press except what is absolutely pressing. And I, this is the only thing that I've found <clears throat> really works for me. Okay, that demarcation is important, temporally and spatially. Who else would like to contribute? I might need to try that because <laughs> I'm failing at this particular <laughs> task right now. Um, I do have like a, a shared writing uh, date, so to speak, every weekday at nine with a handful of folks. Um, but like this week, I've been really bad and I've just been doing Neon Hemlock editing work. So um, I don't quite have the physical space, I think, that I could do there, but um, something to um, do a better job of setting boundaries there. Because um, otherwise, I just... I, if you just don't sleep, you can accomplish like a lot. I mean, everything's if, fine. If, if we're talking sci-fi here, so why should why are any of us sleeping? Actually, that's we're kind of falling down on our job here. Um, well, yeah. as, as someone who's definitely a night owl, uh, I I struggle with that because I have a day job that often has calls at seven in the morning because of the various time zones, and then. I stay up too late because night owl and that's when my creativity happens. But uh, <laughs> so yeah, demarcating the space might be nice. Um, but I found that at least for me, like I sometimes I struggle a lot with imposter syndrome um, for various things in life. But actually just doing what Dave was saying, like gathering with a group of writers and like just doing it, just writing, um, even if it's a shitty first draft, even if it's a prompt and goes nowhere, like at least you're doing the act of it. Um, I found that that really helped me. I've, I've uh, for a while been going to Split This Rock's uh, free writing workshops offered through the community and um, uh, 
and and those are just really helpful because it's always somebody different that's teaching a different prompt different ideas of of what what even to focus on um and then i think i wanted to mention something else um uh yeah just i think that no like giving myself the space to not always be productive um, I have a lot of pressure on myself to like, you know, always be writing something or always be producing or always be submitting. And sometimes it just doesn't happen. And I think that it's, that's okay, uh, too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Reading is also part of the work and yeah. Um, you know, whatever you need to do to keep that creativity going is the main thing. Um, Amalia, what would you like to add? First, oh, there we go. I'm still trying to figure stuff out. <laughs> some some days, some months, I am very good at balancing. So in this spot of time, I will do, I will work on the magazines in this spot of time. I will attempt to write and not look at TV tropes too much. And other times it's just, ugh. There goes my organization. I'm just going to do what I can and put off the rest until later. Yeah, it's a work in progress. So um, we have uh, about four minutes left. So if I could ask for just a lightning round to take us out here, um, what advice would you have to someone who thinks, oh, I want to write speculative, but I don't think I can? I'm not the right person. I don't have, you know, a science background or I don't know what dragon, you know, morphology is or whatever. Um, what advice, like one piece of advice would you give to someone who isn't quite ready but wants to write speculative? Don't self-reject. Excellent. Yes, that's a great one. Um, also, maybe just think about what's the craziest dream or nightmare you had. Um, dreams like don't really hold back. So that can be a good starting point. Okay, thank you. That's and a good I idea. Also, uh, sorry. I would also say, um, speaking of reading, immerse yourself in the kind of work. I mean, it, it does, you absorb things that way you absorb how things are done <laughs> and what readers expectations are and that helps tremendously thank you that's so important every time you read something that, that is the kind of tricky thing like the caveat for folks who are getting into speculative stuff for the first time is if they aren't widely read in the genre they could sort of be like falling through all these different tropes that we like sort of read all the time but they haven't had that chance yet but like for your first page, like just do it. So my advice would be to write a ghost story. I feel like people have a lot of um, ghost story ephemera in their head and it's, it's like slightly the rules maybe or like a little bit more fickle and easy to play with. Um, and it might be less daunting. Okay, look at that, all that's good advice. Thank you so much to all of my panelists. Thank you for everybody watching. And um, yeah, just do it, join us. Join us in the stratosphere. Join us in the nebulous regions of fiction. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us tonight. Thanks for moderating as well. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely.